really excited about today and continuing our journey on freedom. And we started out this month talking about the idea of desiring freedom. You know, I shared with you all that I was kind of being obsessed watching all these shows on Netflix about liberation of Latin America back, you know, when there was Spanish rule and all of the passion and the excitement and the commitment that people had to this concept of freedom. I mean, it's not really just about those shows and that era or that particular location of the world. It's something that is everywhere, that is part of our eternal existence. It is that freedom call that we always have from within, no matter what the circumstance is. And I could be a little bit maybe off about things, but I feel like in our modern times, we've lost a little bit of that desire for freedom. That we have accepted the bondage of modernity. We've accepted the bondage of cell phones even, of technology. We've gotten away from this concept of what is it really, truly, deeply, honestly, profoundly, and significantly mean to be free. And when I say that, I'm talking about do you, can you, are you in the process of feeling your spirit soar? Can you feel that? Do you want to feel that? Are you committed to feeling that? And so this is what we're in this month with all of this wonderful energy that we have. Today is Juneteenth celebration. Tomorrow, good people, wow, national federal holiday. Amen. And so we're in this in this time also of of, of LGBTQ plus pride and all of this, what does it mean to be free? And so for us, we're in that now, wanting to not just say, oh, it's that community, and it is those people. No, this time, this celebration, this jubilation gives you the opportunity to be able to feel for yourselves what could it mean, what does it mean, what should it mean. And so we take all of this. We started our journey a couple weeks ago with this con- concept of liberating the authentic self. And that was about having us think through maybe the parts of ourselves that we have lost, the parts of ourselves that we let go, that maybe we let other people like our partners in the past or our teachers in the past or our parents in the past or whatever, tell us that we couldn't do something or we shouldn't do something or we ourselves have limited ourselves of something that makes us feel joyous and free and ourselves truly authentic. So we started by talking about that. What does that mean to go back to that authentic selves? What parts of you are you holding back What are the things that make you feel joyous and free and authentic that maybe you stop doing? I was opening up uh, Yo Play Yogurt the other day, and this is not, I'm not paid to to advertise, by the way. But I'm obsessed with the ones in in the glass jar, and they have now the coconut ones that are, you know, they're coconut milk based. And so, does anyone open, and when you open up the lid, and the little paper, it has like a little saying or an affirmation or a question. Anybody with me on that one? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, we'll go get a yogurt, play yogurt, y'all. And so I open it up to eat my delicious yogurt, and I see that it says, what can you do today to feel like you? And I was like, yes, that's what I mean. And for me, the flash was like, dance. So this is what we're talking about. Where do we, how do we start getting in there. And sometimes the way to get in there is small with these small things in life. It doesn't have to be grandiose like, I'm going to save the world, right? I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'm going to ministerial school. I mean, it doesn't. It's simple. I want to dance more. I want to sing more. I'm going to go and share the unity message out with the world. Whatever. It can be small. But taking those steps 
Today, we're going to be talking about the courage to be free. The courage that it takes to be free. See, because as Americans, as folks in the Western world, you know, we pride ourselves on this idea of freedom. That we all are free, that this is what our foundation of our country is on, and there's some truth to that, there's truth to that. But yet, let's take that to task. How many of us are truly free? What does it mean? The question we ask today is how many of us are really living in bondage? Bondage of the mind, bondage of this idea of lack. Bondage of fear, that we live in fear all the time. We may not have enough. I'm not enough. My partner's not enough. Always in that space, that is not being free. Most of us, many of us, heck, maybe all of us at some point in time, are living our lives paralyzed. Paralyzed in fear, stuck in what our lives are and wanting, wanting to be free, but not knowing how. And maybe at some deep level, I'm going to say it, at some deep level you don't believe that you have the right to be free. And so this is what we're doing here. When we think about today, Juneteenth, and I'm not going to go into all the history, but I'll just quickly, for those of us who might not know, January 1st, 1863, was the Emancipation Proclamation, which meant that all folks of color, all those that were in slavery, that were enslaved people, were given freedom. And of course, Texas, my family is from Texas, so I know some Texans. Um, and the Texans didn't, slave owners didn't necessarily want that information out. And so it wasn't shared widely across the state. So two years later, June 19th of 1865, the, um, the Union Army came through Galveston, Texas and announced to the people of Galveston and the people of Texas that there was no longer slavery. And so of course there was all of this excitement and this wonder and joy. And so Juneteenth was for June 19th together. June 19th, it's called Liberation Day. It's also called Jubilation Day because excitement, the joy of being free, knowing that you're free. This era that came after that was really a time of hope for African Americans. It was a time of hope for everyone in the country. It was a time of, yes, uncertainty and struggle as a nation. But it was this idea, this inspiration, this empowerment that we could change our lives, that we could change the course of our nation. But it took great courage. It took great courage for communities to even get to that point. Much has happened. Did y'all know, I, I, I blew my ever-loving mind, they celebrate Juneteenth for years in Mexico. In Coahuila, Mexico, there is a community of former black Seminoles. And the Seminoles went, uh, or indigenous peoples, and then the um, folks that were enslaved that escaped down to Florida, intermingled with the indigenous Seminoles, and then when all this repatriation happened to the reservations, they escaped into Mexico. And so there's a vibrant community that is there and they've celebrated for decades. But think about this. I think about this often. You know, most of us sitting here live, I think, pretty good lives. Yes, we might have afflictions, we might have pains, we might have dramas, we might have traumas, we might have some histories, we might have some addictions. Doesn't mean that those aren't important and it doesn't mean that they're not real. But 
think about what it really meant at some time for someone to know, even if they were born into an, an, an enslaved situation, to know in their heart, in their soul, in their mind's eye that I am free. I deserve to be free and to make that trek oftentimes across borders. Maybe I'm the only one, but I sometimes look across the landscape here in Tennessee and even right here on our property and I think, God, this is potentially former plantations, right? And thinking of what that means. And instead of it making me sad, it gives me this sense of empowerment. It gives me this sense of thinking about the ability that we all have to change our lives, to have strength, to have faith, to have hope, to have possibility. This is the legacy that we have to look forward to. This is the legacy that we have to celebrate. This is a legacy that we carry within us. You know, I went home last weekend with the idea of you know, taking my Sunday off, I was gonna go see my mom, went to Chicago, and Sunday, after I took a shower, put lip balm on, and when I went to kind of chop my lips, my lips felt a little weird, and I thought, hmm, that's odd, but I kind of let it go, but it did feel weird. So I went to have a meal with some friends there at home, uh, they were coming over and hanging out, and I started to feel just really odd in my face throughout the meal, and I couldn't figure it out, just didn't know what was going on, and I decided, let me go to the restroom and look at it, because something's off here, and when I went to the restroom, I could see that I wasn't blinking in my right eye, and I had a slight, slight droop in my lip. But I really, again, didn't know what it was, but I knew something wasn't right. I mean, I went home to Chicago the day before, I'd gotten a haircut, I was like, I wanted a new look, but this was not part of the plan, y'all. <laughs> Let me just say. So I went to the urgent care, and I saw the doctor pretty immediately, and she did, you know, the kind of tests they usually do, look this way, look at that, you know, squeeze this, squeeze that, whatever. And pretty soon after, she just looked at me, and she said, I'll be right back, and then she flew out the door. And I was like, mm, this is probably not good. So she comes back and she's like, I think you might be having a stroke and we need to get you to the ER. So they called an ambulance and sent me to the ER. Never been in the ER uh, through an ambulance, bucket list, no one ever said. So, but did that now in my life. After being in the ER for a little bit, they uh, weren't sure still if it was a stroke or not, so they admitted me. So I was there a couple of days until, you know, they ran tests and I saw the neurologist and all that and they finally determined what it was, was an episode of Bell's palsy. You know, for the beginning, I had this idea that, okay, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm just going to surrender I'm just going to surrender and I'm going to accept whatever this is. And yet at the same time, immediately went into what I know as my tools. And this is why I just tell you all every week the importance of practicing daily, whatever that means for you all, but practicing because in those moments of like emergency, literally or figuratively, in those moments when you need something, in those moments when you need some kind of something, spirit is able to co-create with you. Spirit is able to move in easily with you because you've already had that spiritual muscle building. And so I just kept saying, the prayer of protection, the light of God surrounds me. Kept saying it. I tell you this because oftentimes we have situations that happen, and I say spirit is funny. Spirit is funny because I'm talking about freedom, and here I have slight paralysis, right? <laughs> so, but spirit will come in to provide those lessons for us. 
But the question is, can we hear them? Can we be able to accept them? There was a, a couple nights after I was home that I was in a lot of pain initially, and uh, I didn't I want to take any kind of medication. And so I was kind of going through it, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was up, and all of a sudden I hear a bird outside. Not normal at 2 in the morning, right? Like one lone bird. And I had a friend that told me a few weeks back to start talking to the birds. And I thought, okay, I'm already out there, y'all. Like, you all really want me to go further? <laughs> so I said, you know what? What have I got to lose? So I, you know, in my mind's eye, asked the bird, what do you have to say to me? What, what is the message that you have for me? And I heard the cage bird sing. And I was like, okay. I had to process that and pray over that and meditate. And then I remembered when I was really young, I read Maya Angelou's book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And then it started to become clear to me what the message was. In the book, the character is a young girl who is besieged by, you know, rape and uh, racial oppression, and all of these things, and yet she perseveres. That book is autobiographical fiction. It's based on Maya Angelou's life. It's a powerful book, but it is also a reminder that no matter what the circumstances is, you are always free. Freedom is a choice, people. Freedom is something that we possess inside no matter what is happening in our lives. And when we tap into that knowing, when we tap into that reality, when we tap into that sacred connection, then life changes. And you are free and you are jubilant. Her poem, my Angelou's poem, I know why the cage bird sings. I'm not going to go through it, but I would suggest you read it because it's a beautiful poem. But it ends by saying, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill where the caged bird sings of freedom. Again, the author implies that even though the bird is caged, you can still experience that freedom deep down. And even if there's fear about the unknown, like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how long I'm going to be like this. I don't know what is going to be, but I know that no matter what, I'm freaking free. We're singing that song today. I share this with you all so that we all can sing the song today. You know, Jesus, our way sure, was all about reminding people that they were free. No matter what their circumstances was, no matter what country they came from or what their origin was or what their physical capability to capability was, whether they were a man or a woman, what their gender was, he reminded everyone that they were free. But he said this in John, we know you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But what is the truth? The truth is, good people, that you are a child of God. The truth is that you are the anointed one. The truth is that you have been brought here to be God's missionary. The truth is that you are sacred and special more than you will ever know. The truth is we have to start acting like it. In Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 34, Jesus is talking to a man who is both deaf and can't speak. 
And so he goes into this journey with him to be able to heal him. And I'm just going to read just a quick bit because I think it's really important for what we're doing here today. I've got to take these off. Isn't that funny? You can't see with glasses. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took him aside and private away from the crowd and put his fingers in his ear, and then he spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to the heaven. He sighed, and he said to him, If fatha, that is, be opened. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Ephatha. It's interesting because in the Bible, if you recall, in the New Testament, you know, all the translations are translated to you know, English, Latin, Greek, but there's a few words that retain in every language the Hebrew word, and that's a Hebrew word, ephatha, to open. Can you imagine that man was probably, like many of those that Jesus healed, feeling himself lonely, feeling himself not part of a community, not being able to speak or to hear, maybe somebody that felt shame, that felt guilt, that felt discouraged about life, that felt he wasn't worthy, that felt that his life was over. And yet Jesus comes and says, be opened. And he changes. But what we know is when I say act like it, the original sin that we have is not what we've all been told. The original sin that we have is our separation with spirit. Our separation with the holy, our separation with the sacred. And so when we do that, when we come back into connection, when we build our lives around trying to be back in alignment and connection, then we have come back into that spirit. We've come back into that opening. And so therein lies the difference. When we are in that sin, sin for unity is only negating who you really are. Sin is about being in that negativity. Sin is about being in that mindset that locks you in to what you can't do. You're on that scarcity model, not in the being into the prosperity and abundance of life. And when you do that, it's what brings us sadness and fear and anger and shame and hurt and blame and critique and unforgiveness. So for us, it's about allowing whatever's happening in our lives, being courageous to be free, being connected to that freedom song of that caged bird, being able to say that we are not trapped in our minds and our hearts are not hardened and our spirits are not paralyzed. We are free. So as I move to close, I ask you here today, how will you be open? How are you closed to life? What are the ways in which you're closed to life? And I don't, some of you are like, I ain't closed. Yes, you are. We can't be in this world, in this society oftentimes without having that. That's just the truth that we hold in balance. The truth of who we are, the truth that will set us free, and this other part of the humanity part that sometimes we have to sort of be in balance with, that we have to sort of allow and know that it's there. So what are you, how are you closing off in life? I used to read daily for years, Emmett Fox's, he's a metaphysician and new thought person from years back, and he had this book called 365 Days with Emmett Fox, and it was teachings every day from Emmett Fox. And I always remember there was this one story about this man who was put in jail, 
And I don't remember what he did or why, but he was put in jail, and he was living a miserable life, and can you imagine? He's in jail, right? And he's there for two decades. And finally, one day, he was just so distraught and so overwhelmed and and just in his own emotion and just, he grabbed and held the door and the door kind of moved a little bit. And then he grabbed it and he felt it opened. He walks out the door, he looks around, there is no jailer, there is no one. And it was that moment that he realized he himself was the jailer. He himself had put him in those chains. He himself was the one that was holding him back. No one else. So I ask you, where in your life are you holding yourself back? Are you paralyzed by fear or worry? Where in your life do you need a blessing? Do you need an opening? And so we're going to do this. I am going to ask I'm going to ask somebody, anybody, who would like to stand and share with me so that we can bless you in this moment how you would like to be opened. And we will say with you those words, Ephatha. I will wait. Who would like to be opened here today? What would you like to open to? If you don't want to stand up, shout it out. I see Colleen back there. Okay. Healing power of the Christ consciousness to be able to deal with the, an illness. Together, Ephatha. Spiritual guidance, Ephatha. Abundance, Ephatha. Infinite potential, Ephatha. More forgiveness, Ephatha. Thank you. All of us can hold that today, right now. Spirit knows what is in your heart. What are you opening to here and now? What is your freedom song? Maybe you actually get a freedom song. Uh, Some of y'all know, uh, Katrina knows because she gave me a little thing. My freedom song is Eminem's Lose Yourself. Look it up, y'all. when, I'm, when I need some mojo, I get me some m M&M. So, um, you know, get yourself a freedom song. Get yourself a freedom song and know what you are opening up to. Claim that opening, that freedom. Those people who have lived in decades and eras where they were literally no freedom, knew their freedom song. Begin to connect and know your freedom song. We are loosening the chains of poverty. Ephatha. We are loosening the chains of oppression. Ephatha. We are loosening the chains of ignorance. Ephatha. We are loosening the idea that we cannot heal ourselves. Ephatha. We are loosening this idea that we are not worthy. Ephatha. We are loosening this idea that we have to be more than what we already are as the divine child, children of the Most High. Ephatha, 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 Ephatha. Be opened, and so it is.